Welcome, everyone. Uh, I am not Arthur Brooks. Uh, Arthur was planning to be here today to introduce uh, our speaker and was detained with the weather and his tr travel and couldn't, uh, couldn't make it. Uh, my name is Jeff Eisenach, and I am a visiting scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute and director of our Center for Internet, Communications, and Technology Policy. Uh, today's uh, speaker, uh, who I'm going to who I've known for many years uh, and I'm going to talk about for just a second, uh, is a guest blogger uh, on uh, AEI's uh, technology blog today, techpolicydaily.com, techpolicydaily.com. So if you're interested in technology policy and if you're interested in what Speaker Gingrich is going to be talking about today, uh, visit techpolicydaily.com and uh, there's a place where you can sign up to get daily updates because it is in fact a daily uh, publication. Uh, I also want to point out before we get too far into this that there is a hashtag for today's event as there must be for all things digital these days uh, and that is uh, hashtag tech for vets, T-E-C-H for for vets v e t s hashtag tech for vets uh, so visit that uh, I first met Newt Gingrich in 1989 uh, 25 years ago uh, he was on his way he was in a backbencher he had, uh, campaigned three times for Congress in Georgia when he uh, was elected to Congress he was the first Republican only member of the Republican congressional delegate, the only Republican member of the Georgia delegation at the time, uh, elected in 1978 on his third try for office and spent a bunch of time on the back bench during which he attracted a lot of people's attention uh, as a man of ideas. Uh, and that reputation has never left him and it's been well deserved uh, throughout his career. Uh, 30 years ago next month, in fact, he published uh, a book called Window of Opportunity. It's still available uh, on Amazon. And many of the ideas that you're going to hear him talking about today are ideas that he's been talking about throughout that entire period. 20 years ago, about a month from now, uh, Newt was the motive force, along with Dick Army and some others, behind the contract with America, which laid out for the first time a reform conservative agenda. And I think if there's anything that people think of or should think of when they think of Newt Gingrich, it's a conservative with a vision, uh, with a plan, and with a mission. Conservatives are sometimes known as people who are happy to settle for the status quo. Today is good enough. Our job is to protect tradition, and protecting traditions is of great value, of course, and important. Uh, but Newt is of the brand of conservatives who looks beyond that and asks the question, what can we do to be making things better? What's wrong with the world today? How can we improve it? I call that reform conservatism. And you're hearing an increasing amount of that kind of conservatism coming out of people here at the American Enterprise Institute these days, including Arthur Brooks, Robert Doerr, and others, uh, as AEI increasingly looks at the issues that Newt has talked about for so many years uh, and asks the question, what can we do to correct the problems of the welfare state to improve the lives of people that need to be improved. Those are questions that Newt has been asking uh, arguably longer than any uh, conservative in public life. Uh, Newt has had a long career beyond that, which I won't walk you through step by step. I will say that uh, from 1999 until April 2011, when he left to re-enter the political world, uh, Newt was a senior fellow here at AEI uh, and did a tremendous amount of work, again, on many of the issues that we're going to hear about today. <clears throat> One of the themes, maybe a central theme, uh, in Newt's work has been the uh, capacity, the opportunity to bring technology, both mechanical technology, both the machines and the software and the code, the, the hardware, if you will, of technology, but also the software, the new ways of thinking and of doing things, uh, better technology uh, to the job of doing what government does, to replace the bureaucratic welfare state, bureaucratic institutions with modern institutions that work more like what we have learned to expect from the modern digital economy and less like uh, what we despise uh, when we have to deal with uh, correctly, uh, when we have to deal with organizations like the IRS or too many departments of motor vehicles. Um, that theme is going to come through today. 
Uh, and uh, that's all I'm going to say, except that uh, it is a tremendous honor and great pleasure for me to welcome my old friend, uh, Speaker Newt Gingrich, uh, to the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be back with you, and it is, um, okay, that's good. Uh, I'm now me, although I'm now looking at Jeff Eisenhower, so it's, uh, I'm delighted to be here. I, I want to thank Arthur Brooks and AEI for giving me this opportunity to propose a very large, bold rethinking of both the health system and the bureaucracy in the context of the Veterans Administration crisis. Uh, Cliss and I spent over a decade as part of the AEI family, and it is always good for us to be back here discussing ideas. I also want to thank the CNN investigative team who stayed on the VA scandals until they broke through and became a national crisis. Early on, the CNN stories were dismissed as isolated, small problems, but the team's continued effort grew the facts until they had to be dealt with. Our thinking on the future of the Veterans Administration has been deeply influenced by the hard work of Chairman Jeff Miller and Senator Richard Burr and their fine committee staffs in the House and Senate. We are much further down the road because of their help. They have worked tirelessly and against a lot of opposition to help America's veterans have a better future. Finally, I want to thank Ali Meshkin, who has been our chief researcher on the VA and who developed the interactive map you will see in a few minutes. I also want to thank Ross Worthington and Vince Haley at Gingrich Productions for helping think through these proposals. Callista and I owe them a great deal for their talent and hard work. Now, let me say up front, this is going to be a bold, indeed by Washington standards, a radical speech. I am going to use terms that are not common in Washington policy circles. In order to avoid shocking or disorienting you, let me share a few of these key new ideas ahead of time. Smartphone. Smartphone apps. iPad. Facebook, Google, Khan Academy, Duolingo, Words with Friends. As you can see, this is not your typical Washington policy speech. Yet you know in your non-policy life that these words are now part of everyday life. Facebook was founded in February 2004. Ten years later, it has 1.3 billion monthly users. There is no government subsidy for joining Facebook and no government training program for how to be on Facebook. Google was founded in September 1998 and has grown into a worldwide index of knowledge with well over a billion searches a day and a host of other capabilities. Smartphones date commercially to 1994 and today Three out of every four Americans owns a smartphone. You can get a smartphone for free with a service contract or for as little as $50 online. Many people in the developing world have revealed that they will invest in a smartphone before indoor plumbing. Now, I'm going to ask all of you, I'm curious, take out your smartphone if you have one with you. Just get a sense of the audience here. Um, <clears throat> You are holding the entry point for a massive information system. And I think it's very important to understand that. The, every time you think the proposals in this speech are unrealistic, I want you to look at your own smartphone and the apps you already have installed on it. Which is more representative of our future? The current failing bureaucracies or the smartphone in your hand. We have the opportunity to create a 21st century veterans service system empowering veterans to use their smartphones to recenter services on their lives at their convenience and with the veteran rather than the bureaucrat in charge. This vision of a dramatically more effective, more modern, more responsive veteran-centered system 
to replace the current failing bureaucratic system is part of a much larger opportunity to think about the transition from late 19th century bureaucracies to 21st century citizen-centered government. There are three major reasons to have a, rash, a national dialogue about the future of veterans' health care. First, we owe it to our veterans to get them the best possible health outcomes with the greatest convenience at the lowest cost. It isn't enough to eliminate the worst aspects of the current bureaucratic mess. We have to be able to answer affirmatively the question, is this the best we can do for our veterans? Anything less should be unacceptable. A slightly improved VA bureaucracy clearly fails that test. Second, the lessons we learn in thinking through a 21st century veterans health system will teach us a lot about the characteristics of our future health system for all Americans. The same technologies that will improve veterans health will help improve everyone's health. Third, replacing this obsolete bureaucracy with a new 21st century system will teach us a lot about how to replace every other bureaucracy. The VA could be the forerunner in a generation of profound transformation in government. The changes we have seen in information technology are so enormous and historic that the next few decades will be the most creative in rethinking government since the Founding Fathers. In virtually every field, pioneers of the future are developing new technologies, new science, new solutions, new products, and new ideas. These breakthroughs are occurring in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, and in some rare instances in government. They're going to continue and accelerate. Just as the Founding Fathers had to think through the relationship between organized power, government, and free citizens, so we have to think through the relationship between organized public effort and the technologies which are revolutionizing our lives. My recent book, Breakout, outlines the scale of change that is occurring around us and begins to imagine a new 21st century model of government that takes advantage of this emerging world. Our current federal bureaucracy is trapped in the late 19th century. Bureaucracy is largely an intellectual pattern developed around 1870, about the same time as the manual typewriter. They were the clerical requirements of the manual typewriter and carbon paper, which led to a Pentagon of enormous scale. It's 17 miles of hallways and 6.6 .6 million square feet were an extraordinary symbol of American power when they were completed 71 years ago. Yet, to fulfill clerical and administrative purposes dating back to the 1940s, 31,000 people still work at the Pentagon. Modern information technology should enable us to turn the Pentagon into a triangle. We should be able to replace at least 40% of the clerical effort with modern information technology and modern systems of operating. This potential for dramatic rethinking exists throughout the government. Every year, the speed, convenience, accuracy, quality, and affordability we see in most private sector products and services keeps growing. As a result, with each passing year, the gap between the obsolete manual typewriter bureaucracies we have and the modern decentralized citizen-directed government we could have continues to grow. The smartphone and the iPad are symbols of this gap between failing bureaucratic systems and the speed accuracy and convenience we are experiencing in our private lives. Consider another, the international network of ATMs. You can go virtually anywhere in the world, find an anonymous machine, insert a plastic card, punch in a four-digit code, and get local currency in less than 11 seconds. How many of you have had this experience outside the US? Just raise your hand. So two-thirds of the audience. By contrast, with that 11 seconds, it takes 175 days for medical records to move from the Department of Defense to the Veterans Administration.
Virtually no one has a problem with the accuracy of their credit card statements or ATM transactions. The IRS, on the other hand, sent out $4 billion in bad refunds last year, including 343 checks to one house in Shanghai. Medicare and Medicaid have an estimated 70 to 110 billion in fraud every year. Almost every government redistribution program has substantial fraud. The simple fact is that a manual typewriter-based bureaucracy that goes home at 5 o'clock cannot keep up with crooks using iPads and working into the evenings and on weekends. Beyond efficiency and honesty, there's an even more powerful reason to rethink all modern bureaucracies. The manual typewriter bureaucracy inevitably is focused on the bureaucrat. It is devoted to rules that make the citizens subservient to and dependent upon the bureaucracy. Yet, the 20th century, in Carly Fiorina's elegant phrase, will be digital, mobile, virtual, and personal. A government that used digital, mobile, and virtual capability to empower citizens to lead their lives focused on their values and their concerns would be dramatically different from the current federal bureaucracy, which increasingly uses its discretionary power as a tool for social control. Gavin Newsom, the Lieutenant Governor of California and former Mayor of San Francisco, has intriguingly outlined the potential for a citizen-centered, smartphone-enabled 21st century model of government in his book, Citizenville. As Newsom writes, technologies like smartphones in the cloud, quote, enable an enterprise to organize itself in a distributed fashion without central power to deliver and collaborate in ways that you couldn't before. In other words, it gives power to the people, which is the first crucial step in moving away from the top-down, bureaucratic, hierarchical government that's choking our democracy today. Understanding this concept is central to understanding how the government must change and what it must become, close quote. Well, this approach applies everywhere. The Veterans Administration is a particularly good starting point. The scandals, corruption, dishonesty, and failures in serving our veterans are so deep at the VA that it is especially ripe for a fundamental rethinking that shifts from the manual typewriter to the smartphone and from a system centered on the bureaucrats to a system centered on the veterans. This process of thinking in 21st century terms requires adopting three key principles. First, the problems are systemic and not episodic, and models like Deming's Red Bead Experiment are central to refocusing our thinking and our analysis. Second, modern information technology and its ability to empower the citizen and to dramatically improve how we organize public activities is at the heart of how we will rethink government. Third, Systems thinking in modern information technology can only work if the bureaucratic model of the 1870s is replaced with a new, flexible, adaptive, agile system of continuous improvement, continuous measurement of metrics, continuous learning, and continuous willingness to reward achievement and take steps to eliminate failure and dishonesty. These three key steps require the Congress to shift from traditional oversight based on reviewing bureaucratic failure and playing gotcha with individuals to a new model of foresight hearings that focus on breakthroughs in the larger world, models that work, new technologies that empower, and best practices from out throughout the world, not merely from the best bureaucracies. Uh, you can see a paper on 21st century congressional committees and the concept of foresight hearings at GingrichProductions.com. Applying these principles of breakout to rethinking the Veterans Administration goes far beyond the recent reform bill. That bill represents a fascinating balance between the reformers' push for new solutions and the prison guards of the past protecting their bureaucratic turf no matter how bad its record. The VA scandal has been big enough that the reformers won a great, although legislatively time-limited, victory of allowing veterans who have to wait longer than 30 days for an appointment to have the choice of any doctor who accepts Medicare. This step towards choice and competition was probably worth the whole bill, 
but there were a number of other positive reforms. For instance, in one of the most remarkable steps, it permits the Secretary to expedite firing of senior officials. In order to get these reforms, the reformers had to agree to open 27 additional clinics and provide $5 billion to hire more people for the VA bureaucracy, even though the current productivity is so low that modest improvements in performance would have improved veterans' health without a larger bureaucracy. That extra $5 billion was the price of having an avowed socialist who believes in bureaucracy and a government-run health system chair the Veterans Affairs Committee in the Senate. The bill that President Obama signed into law on Thursday is only a start. Thankfully, there is some bipartisan agreement that the reform effort needs to go much further. President Obama himself said, quote, this will not and cannot be the end of our efforts. American Legion National Commander Daniel Dillinger said in a statement that, quote, the VA reform package is an important step in the process to begin repairing systemic problems in the Department of Veterans Affairs, but it is only one step and only a beginning. Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina, the ranking Republican on the Veteran Affairs Committee, agreed that the bill was only the beginning of what it will take to repair a, quote, horrendous bless blemish on the VA's reputation. House Committee Veterans Affairs Chairman Jeff Miller said, quote, it starts a conversation about the VA for the future. The VA is not sacred, the veteran is. Congressman Mike Michaud said, quote, getting a bill signed into law is only the first step. Now the real work begins. Senator John McCain, the most famous veteran in the Senate said, quote, this bill is a beginning, not an end, to the efforts that must be taken to address this crisis. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy may have offered the most forward-thinking analysis of any member of Congress when he wrote in a USA Today op-ed, quote, a modern VA must accept the modern world and not cling to its old bureaucratic past. It must give veterans the ability to access private care, streamline its system, and remove bad employees who retain their jobs at the expense of our veterans. Real reform is possible but only if we unshackle ourselves from the old idea that more bureaucracy, more government, and more money will solve today's problems. It's time to try something new. It's time to build a 21st century VA." Close quote. The scale of reforms needed is suggested by this interactive map that Ali Meshkin has developed for Gingrich Productions, which you can find at GingrichProductions.com backslash VA map. We developed this uh, when CNN first began exposing, starting in Phoenix, uh, various scandals, and people kept saying, well, it's isolated, it's isolated. There are now 62 sites that are up there. Each of them, when you go to the interactive map at Gingrich Productions, allows you to go and look at the data on each site. And we did it to make the case this can't possibly be random episodes. This is a system in collapse. And I'm very proud of the work that, that Ali and others did. Uh, there are 62 locations in 31 states in the District of Columbia. However, and this is what's amazing about where we are. Despite all the evidence, there are still supporters of bureaucratic big government who continue to believe in the current VA bureaucracy. In 2007, Ezra Klein stated that, quote, the VA's lead in care quality isn't disputed. In 2011, Paul Krugman promoted the VA as a model, quote, to be emulated by the rest of our healthcare system. Even after all the recent revelations, the true believers stayed firm. Krugman wrote in a recent New York Times op-ed, quote, it's still true that Veterans Affairs provides excellent care at low cost. And I think that one, anytime you see Paul Krugman, just remember that one quote because everything else he says is equally out of touch with reality. Senator Bernie Sanders maintained in the wake of the recent scandals, quote, I'm chairman of the Veterans Committee. Let me tell you some news. The Veterans Administration provides very high quality health care, close quote. Before I outline and we propose a bold new 21st century veteran service system, I want to examine these claims because if they're right, we don't need bold reform. It's important to understand how badly broken and how deeply corrupt the current VA bureaucracy is. The current public outcry started when we learned that at least 40 veterans died 
on a secret waiting list in Phoenix. But that was only the beginning. Back in February, we learned that VA employees in Los Angeles destroyed veterans' medical records to hide their backlog. It soon became clear the corruption in the appointment system was pervasive. The preliminary June 2014 audit found what investigators call, quote, a systemic lack of integrity throughout the VA. The final audit confirmed corrupt scheduling practices across the department at 70% of the VA medical facilities surveyed, finding that 57,000 veterans had been waiting more than three months for an appointment. But the scheduling practices and the appointment backlog are only the beginning. It takes 175 days to transfer a veteran's medical records from the Defense Department to the VA. The VA and Defense Department have spent $1.3 billion over the past four years attempting to build a joint system for electronic health records before announcing in February that they were giving up. As of February, there were 400,000 disability claims that were considered backlogged. They'd been in process for more than 125 days. An Inspector General report found that an electronic record system developed at the VA to help manage this problem had cost $500 million, but was crippled by poor planning, design, and implementation. The care is often alarmingly bad. In Albany, a VA employee injected dying veterans with water instead of morphine in order to steal the drugs. There are lots of instances of narcotics theft, although this is one of the most disturbing. In Mississippi and elsewhere, patients were prescribed narcotics without seeing a doctor. Waiting times at VA emergency rooms are twice the national average. Senator Tom Coburn's office produced a report that found, quote, the VA has spent over $200 million in the last 10 years in an attempt to compensate victims for its mistakes. More than 1,000 veterans needlessly died under the VA's watch, and the department in turn paid these veterans' families $200 million in wrongful death settlements the median payment per victim was 150000 Most families of the victim agreed it was not about the money. They just wanted the VA to be held accountable for its action. Close quote. But the system serves the bureaucrats perfectly. Between 2006 and 2013, the number of full-time employees jumped more than 40%, from 220,000 to 314,000. The VA's budget is up even more, 90% over the same period. Yet, with 94,000 additional government employees and almost twice as much money, the left still believes the problem is that the VA is underfunded. The VA workforce is larger than the Marine Corps. More than 314,000 work full-time for the VA compared to 202,000 the Marine Corps, which is potentially shrinking to 150,000, at which point there would be half as many Marines as VA bureaucrats. Despite the widespread incompetence and corruption, VA leadership has seen fit to reward the vast majority of senior officials with performance bonuses. Last year, 78% of VA senior managers received these bonuses when they got performance ratings of, quote, outstanding or, quote, exceeds fully successful. 470 of them got ratings of fully successful or better. So despite the disaster they're overseeing, all of the VA's top 470 employees are performing wonderfully. In some cases, <clears throat> these bonuses were outrageously unwarranted. The former director of the VA Medical Center in Atlanta was paid $65,000 in bonuses over four years, even though the VA's inspector general blamed several preventable deaths on widespread mismanagement there, according to the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. The senior executives aren't the only people with nice VA jobs. The Coburn report found that, quote, as of February 2017, 2013, there were 277 VA employees performing as union representatives on 100% official time. In 2011, the VA spent $42.6 million in cost related to maintaining official time employees, close quote. An average private sector primary care physician, the Coburn Report finds, has an average caseload of 2,300, yet the VA targets 1,200 for its physicians. Unlike private sector hospitals, which have intensive use of operating rooms, some VA facilities close their operating room by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Getting to the truth about VA misbehavior 
has been unnecessarily hard. VA bureaucrats have routinely lied to Congress. The department misled Congress about the number of deaths in the gastrointestinal department, claiming its findings were based on a system-wide review since 1999, when in fact the numbers were based on a handful of cases from a two-year period. Congressman Patrick Meehan has said that VA officials, quote, looked me in the eye and lied to me about falsifying records. He continued, quote, at every turn, the VA has thwarted any attempt of honest, effective oversight. The basis of any relationship is trust, but the misrepresentation made by the VA in Philadelphia have demonstrated a culture of cover-up and deceit." <clears throat> Close quote. Similarly, a VA director in Alabama assured Congresswoman Martha Roby that employees who falsified records there were fired. Quote, I have now learned that wasn't true, she said. No one has been fired. Much as its culture results in bureaucrats who mislead Congress to cover up the department's failures, the VA routinely silences whistleblowers. The New York Times reports that, quote, staff members at dozens of Department of Veterans Affairs hospitals across the country have objected to ye for years to falsified patient appointment schedules and other improper practices, only to be rebuffed, disciplined, or even fired after speaking up. The Times continues, quote, the Federal Office of Special Counsel, which investigates whistleblowing complaints, is examining 37 cases of retaliation by VA employees in 19 states. The article tells the story of Dr. Ram Chaturvedi, formerly a doctor with the VA Medical Center in Dallas. He, quote, began complaining in 2008 about shoddy patient care, including negligence by nurses who had marked the wrong kidney while preparing a patient for a procedure. In another instance, uh, Dr. Chaturvedi said medical personnel had brought the wrong patient to an operating table. A supervisor told Dr. Chaturvedi to, quote, let some things slide because of staffing problems but he continued writing up complaints. Officials considered him disruptive and fired him in 2010. The VA's own internal watchdog, the Office of the Medical Inspector, routinely minimized whistleblower allegations by claiming the behavior Ms. Whistleblowers alleged had no effect on care, according to a review by the U.S. Office of Special Counsel. The point is that there's a clear failure of the current VA system. This litany of deaths, mistreatment, criminal violations, dishonesty, lying to Congress, and failing to treat our veterans with dignity and honor should convince any reasonable person that there is something deeply and profoundly wrong about the systems at the VA and the culture that has grown up there. Nothing in the current reform bill will get at the underlying systemic corruption and the network of bureaucrats who protect each other and punish those who would blow the whistle on bad behavior. Remember. In the reform bill, only the top 400 of the 314,000 people who work at the VA are affected by the expedited firing procedures. And some defenders of the old order in Congress have expressed worries about expedited procedures for about one-tenth of one percent of the VA workforce. There are six different unions at the VA. There are at least four master union contracts, each hundreds of pages long. And there are hundreds of local union contracts. These include things like the hundreds of full-time union employees at taxpayer expense. All of these remain undisturbed, even though they're an enormous barrier to reform. If we are serious about helping the veterans, all of these union contracts should be suspended, just as contracts would be suspended in a private sector bankruptcy. Let's be honest. All of us have seen reform bureaucracy after reform bureaucracy with virtually nothing changing. Bureaucracies have deep patterns of self-defense and self-preservation. To ask the people who were deeply engaged in the destructive, sometimes corrupt, often dishonest, and occasionally illegal activities outlined above, to suddenly change and adopt a new work ethic, a new commitment to transparent accountability, and a new enthusiasm for whistleblowers is simply asking for failure. The scale of change we need to ensure our veterans get the best possible care is vastly greater than the recent reforms and far beyond the comfort zone of the traditional political system, which will be happy getting a few scapegoats, declaring victory, and moving on until the next scandal forces new attention to the VA. What we need are two missing components, imagination and a spirit of replacement rather than reform. First, to imagination. 
Just imagine the 21st century veteran service system. You know, the greatest failure in Washington isn't lack of money. It isn't lack of power. It isn't too much partisanship. The greatest failure in Washington is a lack of imagination. Washington is so absorbed in its own petty gossip, its own daily activities, its own definition of practical and realistic, that it is very hard for Washington insiders to relax and let their imaginations develop the possibilities that are all around them. There's a simple fact that can open up everything to the imagination. Everything which currently exists in government was imagined by a president, a Congress, and a court. Our generation has as much responsibility and as great a right to develop a new generation of solutions as did any generation before it. I want to focus on one technological breakthrough to illustrate how dramatically imagination based on practical reality can open up the entire system to new thinking and new possibilities. The smartphone is an empowering breakthrough that exists all around us and yet has not even begun to be integrated into public policy solutions. Think of smartphones as empowerment devices. The first and most important question here is, what and who is at the center of decision and activity? We've grown up in a bureaucratic world built around clerical processes and the manual typewriter. The bureaucrat is at the center of things. The bureaucratic procedures define what happens. The bureaucrat's hours, the bureaucrat's location, the bureaucrat's vacations all define the relationship. In this world, the amount of power the citizens have over the bureaucrats is remarkably small. The amount of power the bureaucrats have over the citizens is remarkably large. Too often, we the people has become we the bureaucrats. The bureaucratically defined, bureaucrat-centered system extends far beyond the Veterans Administration. It was in the Pentagon that presidential appointees were referred to as the summer help. They were only in office for a brief period, and a wise bureaucrat could simply outweigh them. The sincerity and enthusiasm of the new Secretary of Veterans Affairs will presently run up against bureaucratic rules, hopelessly and intentionally complex procurement policies, especially in information technology, which is the biggest need, an unwieldy union contract, and a culture of polite applause with minimal change that has outlasted every president and every secretary. It isn't that Secretary Shinseki was incompetent. He was immersed in a system which simply ignored management and after polite applause for enthusiastic speeches, went back to bureaucracy as usual. The smartphone shatters this bureaucratic dominance because it shifts the location of power to the citizen. This is the potential implied in Newsom's Citizenville and in Steve Goldsmith's and Susan Crawford's new book, The Responsive City. Consider the potential reorganizing and empowering capabilities of the smartphone. If every veteran had a smartphone, and today, three out of every four Americans have a smartphone. They would be empowered to gather information, to interface with health systems 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Imagine further that the VA adopted Carly Fiorina's model of the 21st century as digital, mobile, virtual, and personal. The smartphone with electronic records in the cloud and automated instantaneous decision making would become a new center of gravity, which would replace the bureaucratic model with a veteran-centric model. Consider a VA app for the smartphone, which enabled the veteran to schedule his or her own appointments. You know how this works in your own life. Think of your open table app for restaurant reservations. You tell it what type of food you want, how fancy a restaurant, what neighborhood. You get a list of options with reviews and available tables. You tap reserve. You get an email confirming your reservation. The reservation's computer system blocks off your table so no one else can take it. Your phone reminds you when it's time to leave. You show up. There's no question about whether you made the reservation. There's no secret list. This company's been around since 1998. ZocDoc is the equivalent of open table for doctors. You open the app. You tell it what insurance you have. You tell it what type of specialist you need. It gives you 27 doctors in your area. You compare their ratings. You read their reviews. You choose a doctor. You choose one of the open times in their schedule. You tap reserve. You get an email confirming your appointment. They get an email with all your paperwork and insurance information filled out. You show up. They're ready for you. It's free to the patient. There's no inspector general to investigate why you didn't get an appointment. Average wait time for care with ZocDoc 
is less than 24 hours because doctors have up to 25% last minute capacity from patients who have canceled or rescheduled. <coughs> 15 to 18% of patients would otherwise be going to the emergency room. <coughs> Excuse me. SOCDOC was founded in 2007. It is now serving 5 million patients a month. <coughs> Excuse me. About as many as the VA. They have 400 employees total. Repeat those numbers just so you get a sense of scale. It serves 5 million patients a month in, in scheduling. About as many as the Veterans Administration schedules. They have 400 employees total. The VA employs 1,000 programmers, not counting schedulers. ZocDoc covers more than 40 specialties, 1,000 types of procedures. They're in 48 states by the end of this year. Their market cap is a billion, $400 million. If ZocDoc went to the VA and offered to help with their scheduling software, which they know how to integrate with lots of big insurance companies that have very complex Byzantine systems as a result of merger, mergers and acquisitions, the VA would tell them about the 17 self-imposed requirements that prevent us from using ZocDoc software, including the requirement that ZocDoc has to make all of its software open source so that it can be custom built from scratch by the VA. So even though they'd be prepared tomorrow morning to provide the service, the bureaucracy won't let them. One medical is a doctor's office right here in DC. They have an app. You can book appointments through the app, but more importantly, you can communicate with your doctor. For instance, sending pictures of a rash. They can ask you a few questions and immediately send an electronic prescription to CVS to take care of it. You don't need to take an hour out of your day to go in, and they don't take time away from seeing other patients. Imagine if a 21st century VA had this capability. Doctors could see dramatically more patients in a day. Veterans could get dramatically faster care. Imagine that the veteran's smartphone had a prescription app too, so that every doctor could see every drug prescribed for this veteran by every other doctor. Sometimes you need to go to the doctor's office so they can take your vitals. Wello is a smartphone case that is available for pre-order today. It takes your temperature, your blood pressure, your heart rate, your, your ECG, and your lung function in a couple of seconds. It cost $199. Imagine if instead of going to the VA Medical Center, every veteran could send this information to their doctor right from his or her smartphone. As a side note, AEI's Scott Gottlieb had a great op-ed in the Wall Street Journal last week talking about how the FDA is asserting that adding these functions will subject the entire smartphone to regulation as a medical app. It has been reported that Apple, Samsung, and Google have run into roadblocks at the FAA trying to bring these products to market. Another example, Theranos is a company in California that has automated the 1,000 most common medical lab tests, all of which they can perform using just a few drops of blood. The service we will be rolling out in Walgreens pharmacies. You'll walk in, give a few drops of blood, have the results emailed to your smartphone by the time you walk out the door. Theranos has committed to charging 50% of the Medicare reimbursement rate or less. Imagine if instead of waiting months for such tests at a VA medical center, veterans could go to their local pharmacy and have the result of their smartphone on their smartphone this afternoon, all at cheaper cost than the current system. There are enormous challenges with veterans and mental health. Imagine if instead of waiting for problems to develop, support started immediately with outreach to veterans over their smartphones. Learning apps similar to Khan Academy and Duolingo could help walk veterans through the process of tra transitioning back to civilian life. Imagine if online support networks using technology similar to Facebook or Google Hangout could help veterans form a community to talk to each other about their shared experiences and help identify veterans who may need a higher level of support, all at very little cost and before further challenges, like homelessness, for example, begin to compound the veterans' problems. Imagine that these systems, the scheduling applications to doctor's visits, the prescription functions, were automatically av available 
that they inform both the veteran and the higher levels of the VA of problems in a timely way. Los Angeles could not have deleted the names if the information was on the smartphone. It's that profoundly different. All of this is very different from Secretary McDonald's commitment that, quote, the department we will need to continue to expand the use of digital technology to free human resources that can be applied to the care of veterans. One of the key tests of rethinking the Veterans Administration is whether the primary focus should be internally on improving and strengthening the bureaucracy or externally on empowering and strengthening the veterans. In his keynote address to the disabled American veterans, Secretary McDonald described the traditional philosophy perfectly. Quote, at VA, we're going to judge the success of our individual and collective efforts against a single metric, customer outcomes, veterans outcomes. VA's own strategic plan makes clear. VA is a customer service organization. We serve veterans. If we fail at serving veterans, we fail. We have a lot of work to do, close quote. But there is a huge jump between serving veterans and empowering veterans. The bureaucracy remains at the center of activity in serving veterans. In empowering veterans, the veterans become the center of activity. As a new cabinet officer, Secretary McDonald doesn't yet understand how big his imagination must become to be successful. He states, quote, we are updating the antiquated appointment scheduling system, beginning with near-term enhancements to the existing system, leading to the acquisition of a comprehensive, state-of-the-art, commercial off-the-shelf scheduling system. I believe the department will need to continue to expand the use of digital technology to free human resources that can be applied to the care of veterans. The real challenges Secretary McDonald will face are much larger and more complex than he can imagine. Nothing in his business career prepared him for the regulatory, legal, and bureaucratic barriers which make progress in Washington so difficult and so slow. That's why I believe replacement, not reform, has to be the goal. In order to take advantage of modern information technologies and empower veterans through smartphones in their hands, we have to do more than marginally reform obsolete bureaucracies. We have to think through the principles of organizing human activity in a world of ubiquitous, real-time, mobile computing and information available 24-7 and personalized to each individual connected to the vast computing and data storage of a worldwide network. Every process of the current bureaucracies works to prevent this from happening. For example, one of the most successful medical scheduling companies in America offered to provide its proven technology for real-time scheduling to the VA and was told that federal law and self-imposed internal regulations made it impossible. What is true of VA information technology acquisition is true across the entire federal government. President Obama outlined the information technology modernization problem last year in explaining the gap between the brilliance of his two campaigns in using information technology and the failure of the Obamacare website. Here's what he said, quote, what is true is that our IT systems, how we purchase technology in the federal government is cumbersome, complicated, and outdated. And so this isn't a situation where, on my campaign, I could simply say, who are the best folks out there? Let's get them around a table. Let's figure out what we're doing, and we're just going to continue to improve it and refine it and work on our goals. If you're doing it at the federal government level, you're going through, you know, 40 pages of specs, and this, and that, and the other, and there's all kind of laws involved, and it makes it more difficult. It's part of the reason why, chronically, federal IT programs are over budget, behind schedule, close quote. Sadly, the President didn't leap from this absolutely correct analysis to propose that Congress profoundly overhaul the information technology procurement laws. Google founder Sergey Brin noted the same artificial challenges in health as President Obama described in his healthcare.gov comments. Brin said, quote, generally health is just so heavily regulated, it's just such a painful business to be in, it's just not necessarily how I want to spend my time. Even though we do have some health projects, <clears throat> and we'll be doing that to a certain extent, but I think the regulatory burden in the U.S. is so high that I think it would dissuade a lot of entrepreneurs." Close quote. Secretary McDonald will soon learn why the Defense Department and the Veterans Administration announced in February 
that they were abandoning a multi-year, billion-dollar-plus joint information technology project. Entire sections of law involving information technology, procurement in general, employment rules, bureaucratic personnel rules, and other areas that will emerge have to be replaced and not merely reformed. Only when Congress steps up to the plate and begins to rethink the entire structure of federal bureaucracy will we be in a position to start using our imagination <clears throat> to develop the replacement system which is necessary if we are truly going to help our veterans. There are first steps we can take toward a 21st century veterans service system. Ideally, President Obama would recognize that the overwhelming bipartisan vote for the VA reform bill and the speed and unanimity with which his new Secretary of Veterans Affairs was confirmed indicate that there is a rare zone of bipartisan opportunity to develop a better system for veterans. If he would reach out to the congressional Republicans and pursue new thinking for the VA in a bipartisan manner, he could have an enormous positive impact. The new Congress in January 2015 should launch a series of visionary hearings, bringing in the new technologies and new capabilities and exploring how to move from a bureaucratically centered system to a veterans empowered system. Secretary McDonald has an opportunity to outline visionary changes to improve the lives of our veterans. Because we, the cause of America's veterans is such a patriotic and compelling cause, the Secretary will find pioneering leaders in every field willing to work with him, the White House, and the Congress to develop a new 21st century model. Finally, each of us can tweet, Facebook, even in the old-fashioned way, talk with folks about the new potential, the new opportunity, and the new obligation that we have to bring the best to our veterans by empowering them with all the new tools of the 21st century. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. So, I think we will take questions, but I think there are microphones. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So, if anyone has a comment, question, young man over here. Peter Bigelow, I'm a law student at George Washington. How would you address any uh, privacy issue concerns? A lot of veterans might be a little bit hesitant about putting all of their medical information on the cloud that you mentioned. Well, I think, look, I think there's going to be a permanent challenge with privacy. Uh, and I think that we should have very uh, draconian laws about violating privacy, particularly as it relates to medical records, because I think there is such a high standard you have to meet. On the other hand, I would suggest to you, if you look at the disaster we've had with the way records have been handled in the VA right now, I think that, that you, have, it, it, you, can, you can make it optional. If you don't want to take the risk, you can continue to be in a bureaucratically centered system. But my experience with most people, and particularly your generation, but in general, is people are more and more willing to have the convenience, the accuracy, the speed. Uh, and, and then we have to have systems that are constantly fighting against hacking and constantly fighting against people who I think we should have very, very strong laws for people who uh, violate privacy in that front, because they're threatening the whole society. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I'm Staff Sergeant Eric Barney, United States Air Force. My question to you is, sir, there seems to be a clear lack of bipartisanship and a clear lack of leadership from all sides of government, a government that can't even reform a tax code that um, uh, is too many pages long that even the experts can't tell you what's right and how to fix it, and therefore you get charged, you lose your money. What makes it you think that any change to the VA system is going to ever happen? Thank you. Well, first of all, in this particular case, we just had a bill passed by very, very large bipartisan majorities in both the House and the Senate, and the bill contained a surprising amount of reform, much more than you would have expected a year ago. Uh, the secretary was just uh, approved, I think, by 93 to 0 uh, in the fastest approval of any secretary in recent times. So I think veterans actually gives us an opportunity to talk through this stuff. Now, again, it rapidly becomes hard. You get into the details. There's a reason these bureaucracies survive. They're very good at fighting to protect their turf, and that leads towards a partisanship that's almost overnight. But I do think strong ideas that are supported by the country have a tendency to bring people together because the country forces them together. Hi, I'm a Google Policy Fellow with the American Library Association, and I'm just curious if um, you're proposing to give smartphones to all veterans, how would you address digital, digital literacy and teaching 
especially elder vet veterans, how to use smartphone technology if they're not familiar with it? Uh, well, I'm, I'm partially biased because uh, Callista's 82-year-old mother now routinely um, plays words with friends with, I think, 40 different people and routinely keeps up with Facebook and routinely does lots of things now. You know, and then five years ago, she would have thought it was impossible. So people learn and people adapt. One of the things you have to do, and, and this, this would particularly be true if you're dealing with a population the size of all, all of America's veterans, is you've got to recognize the smartphone system and the, and the sheer computing power of the system enable you, for example, to put things online that are, that are audio and video. I mean, so for somebody who literally can't read at all, you can give them an audio opportunity and a video opportunity to be, to be informed in a way that you can't if you're a bureaucracy. It's the bureaucracy that's going to produce a brochure nobody reads. And I'll bet every one of you has picked up brochures you didn't read. Uh, because people don't like to read very much, and the brochures are written by people who know too much. So you actually have to know everything about the brochure to understand the brochure, uh, which means you don't read it because you can't understand it. Uh, second, if you go to something like Duolingo, which is one of my favorite sites, which is a free language site, uh, which teaches, I think, seven different languages now for free, and by one estimate at Google, Duolingo actually has more language students than all the language classes in the U.S. combined. Um, you can imagine a circumstance in the not very distant future where do, somebody like Duolingo is going to have English in the literacy for people who speak English. So they'll be able to go online to actually learn how to be literate. Uh, and and uh, again, at the margin, if you, if you want to say, here's a person who has a severe mental problem and they have a severe uh, set of wounds and they have a severe, and they're, and they're 86 years old, et cetera, you can, you can create specific people for whom nothing, none of this works. But by the way, the current VA doesn't work either. And I think we have a lot better chance of inventing something that will work than the current bureaucracy does. Let's see this gentleman over here. When this crisis, I'm Henry Hecker, researcher at NARA. When this crisis erupted and veterans decided to go out and see any physician that was willing to see them since the wait was so long to, to get uh, care, uh, the government, our federal government indicated that they would pick up the tab on this uh, through some means, through the VA, would, would pay for it. Uh, isn't there a need to try to develop some special rate for this kind of activity? Uh, is there a need to encourage this activity as a way to solve the crisis? Uh, and if so, why not like a better than Medicare rate, uh, get some special rate uh, that doctors would pay, you know, would pay for care? Or, they'd obtain that amount of money and everybody would feel that uh, something's been done that, that should be done. Uh, yeah, I'm, is it I'm a not foreseeable sure. possibility? And yeah. I don't know if smartphones would assist, they probably would. Well, let me just say, I, I don't know the details of that yet. And I'm very skeptical because the VA has to actually issue regulations for the implementation of all this. And so I wonder how easy those will be. <coughs> but for example, if you, if you, one of the reasons that ZocDoc now works is it actually increases the income of physicians because the average physician has 25% cancellation rate, which means that 25% of their day they're not making any money. And if they can slide somebody in there in an efficient way, they just increase their income by a substantial amount. So part of it is to figure out how do you have an interface where the doctor's winning and the patient's winning, uh, because I, I think the best of a free society is for everybody to win, not to have one side coercing the other. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Benson Branham, and I live here in the District of Columbia. Uh, you gave a uh, massive uh, prescription for changing the bureaucracy, and, uh, and it is clear to me that a lot of that effort would have to come from the citizens and Americans to push the Congress to make those kinds of uh, changes after a, a careful debate. Um, as as a retired veteran, one who's committed to assisting veterans, now, and also believing in good government, and also wanting to have uh, conversations with people and their government. Um, I am uh, uncertain that the, 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 that the faces and voices that look and sound like me uh, are heard and seen. And what I would, uh, would like to do in front of everyone here is, uh, give, is to invite you to uh, uh, 
have dinner with me and some of my friends, veterans, to discuss uh, from a grassroots level, uh, ordinary American citizen level, what, uh, how you, uh, your ideas, so that uh, people don't always have to go outside of Washington to Indiana and Iowa and um, uh, in Oregon. But there are people here in the District of Columbia, even though the veterans, the 30,000 veterans in this city, don't have full equal voting representation in, the, in, uh, in Congress as it should. I would like to invite you to have dinner in my home and we can talk offline and get it scheduled when you come on one of your uh, regular visits to, uh, to the nation's capital. It's up the street from CNN. Okay, well, uh, Vin Sally is sitting right here. If you'll chat with him afterwards, we'll try to find a time to get together. Colby Tyner, I'm a policy analyst with the American Heart Association. You talked about the regulatory uncertainty regarding mobile applications as it stands currently. Uh, the Fidesz report, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, that recently came out of Congress, um, categorized mobile applications based on wellness applications, clinical, and actual healthcare giving applications. But they didn't really define them. And I was just wondering now, how, how is this initiative going to progress with such regulatory uncertainty? Well, I think that there, there are bills in both the House and Senate that are bipartisan that push back pretty hard against the FDA taking a role. And, and I, I think what you have to have is some ability to measure whether or not something works, okay? But I think that that actually is a retrospective, not a prospective ability. Because if, if you make it a hurdle to actually launch any of these things, I mean, the truth is if FDA had been in charge, Steve Jobs uh, would, would not have been able to found Apple. Uh, and and you, you certainly wouldn't, and Microsoft wouldn't exist today. I mean, those guys were in a, in a wildcatting environment making lots of mistakes and developing products, many of which didn't work, uh, but some of which came through. There are now 93,000 medical apps or health apps uh, in a broad zone. The idea that the, v, that the FDA bureaucracy is going to slow down their admission until some bureaucrat has approved them I think should horrify every person who wants to see dramatic progress. And again, you, you, you probably have a standard, which I think exists in state law, that uh, in, in terms of fraud. So if, for example, we bought, just for the fun of it, uh, because we've been talking with Dr. Uh, uh, Burgess, who's a congressman from Dallas, who had an EKG on his smartphone. So we went off and we bought one, too, because we wanted to see what it was all about. And it, it, you, know, you slide it on your phone. You hold it in your hands. It takes an EKG, and it sends it to your doctor, your cardiologist. It's amazing. Well, if somebody says, I'm, I'm making an EKG, they're liable to fraud if it's not an EKG. You don't need the FDA to approve it. And so there ought to be, there ought to be a fraud standard applied for this stuff, but, but that does not require that the government bureaucracies become primary hindrances to the system. And I, I do think you're going to see an extraordinary revolution in, in the impact of smartphones. And I only use smartphone as a, as a generic concept of mobile capability of communicating on a 24-7 basis. And I think it's just going gonna, gonna to explode in the next 10 years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for offering us more of your best and brightest ideas. We're very appreciative. And it's so extra smart of you to start with the VA because um, the veterans are, they cross all, all boundaries. All, almost all Americans support veterans. So thank you for starting with them uh, to help improve the bureaucracy at the end, and, and the system and all the problems. What do we do? What wonderful suggestions do you have for the people who will lose their jobs because of this long needed rollback and cleaning up of the bureaucracy at the VA and other departments in, in Washington, the federal government? Well, I, th I think it depends on which people you're talking about. I mean, if you remember that long section on what's wrong, those people should lose their jobs. I mean, I, I have no problem saying that a, a nurse who substituted water for morphine should be fired this afternoon. I don't have any sympathy. In fact, probably was an illegal action and she go to jail. Uh, second, um, as you shrink bureaucracies, one of the things that, go, that then Governor Manchin did 
is he was trying to meet a, a budget crisis. He simply put in a hiring freeze. And he figured, they discovered that with a hiring freeze, the West Virginia state employment dropped 10% in a year. Because that number of people either retired, left, moved on. So part of what I would suggest is that the federal government ought to have an internal retraining program that says, look, if your job's disappearing, we'll give you the right to bid on another job, but you have to be able to, to learn enough, you have to be able to pass the skills. But that doesn't mean you automatically have to make people unemployed. But frankly, that's the same challenge every business in America faces. I mean, we've been through a tough economy. I don't, I don't think bureaucrats have an automatic right to say, you owe me a lifetime job or I'll, you know. Now, there's a political reality, which is how hard they'll fight. And so you want to make it, you want to make it as unthreatening as possible, but you really do want to manage a, a, a dramatic transition. And I have no problem, although I'm, I'm a very strong national security person, and, and I helped found the Military Reform Caucus in 1981, and I am a hawk, uh, but I tell people I'm a cheap hawk. Uh, and I have no problem saying that we ought to shrink the Pentagon to a, to a triangle uh, because the fact is there's no reason to have 31,000 people pushing paper at the center of the defense system anymore. And they, by the way, are the tip of the iceberg. The total number of pushing papers probably, I'm guessing, closer to 150,000 when you, when you look at the distributed paperwork in the Pentagon. Well, but let me just say, uh, as always, Chris and I are delighted to be back at AEI. We appreciate the audience. Jeff, I was really grateful that you uh, would, would introduce me. We have a long friendship for many, many years. Uh, and I hope you found this a useful starting point. And, and uh, the actual text is available at GingrichProductions.com if you want to. And it's also going to be available at AEI. So thank you all very, very much.